Welcome to Praise Hands, home of the Praise Hands, where we are all about creative, cross-cultural Christianity. I'm your host, Robbie Valderrama. Before we dig in, I want to remind you to follow us on Instagram at Praise Hands Podcast. Learn more about us on the web at praisehands.com. Subscribe to this show and maybe even leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Season four, episode two, coming at you now. We are here today with Dr. Esau McCauley. How's it going? It's going pretty well. How about you? I'm doing good. Doing good. So you're a New Testament scholar and an Anglican priest, and your work's been featured in outlets such as the New York Times, Christianity Today, and the Washington Post. I I just saw you make a tweet and you're like, man, I got in the Washington Post and New York Times in the same day. It's kind of bucket list sort of stuff for a writer, right? That was unexpected. It's so weird because people think that you're busy when they see the article. (laughs) But like the article, it's just like music. The article was written weeks ago. Right. But I submitted them, not even at the same time, but different periods of time. Yeah. And normally when you write something, it's a couple of weeks back and forth with the editing process, which is what happened with the New York Times. But then Mm -hmm. with the Post, they really liked it. And so they published it within a day or so. They were not at all similar. They were two totally different articles about two totally different topics. But one was in the Post and one was in the New York Times. I wouldn't have expected to be in the Washington Post or the New York Times a year ago, this time last summer. And to be in both of them in the same day was definitely unexpected. Yeah, well, how cool. You've got a pretty cool resume. You studied under the direction of N.T. Wright, and you recently released your book, Reading While Black, African-American Biblical Interpretation as an Exercise in Hope. That's a pretty timely title, if you ask me. Yes. It's interesting because once again, people talk about things being timely Mm -hmm. and it's like the secret sauce is I started the book in 2016, 2017. When I started working on the book, there was a couple of things that were in my mind. One is I felt like there were a lot of people who within the African-American context who were questioning the relevance of Christianity to the issues of the day. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I remember hearing some interviews of people say things like, well, this isn't your mom or your dad's civil rights movement. Right. The, the idea was that we're going to construct another way or another path to justice and freedom apart from the Christian tradition. Right. And I said, well, I grew up in Alabama. I grew up surrounded by kind of the stories mm-hmm. of the Christian leaders in the civil rights movement. And so part of me wanted to kind of, present a case for that, for a new generation. But beyond that, I want to be able to give people hope. I wanted to be able to say, not only like we should maintain our Christian faith, Mm -hmm. but that our Christian faith has something relevant to say. The thesis of the book is kind of like the second half of the title, Mm. African-American biblical interpretation as an exercise in hope. So the point of that is that our civil rights movement behind that even kind of during the period of the invisible institution, the black church during slavery, black people found in the biblical text and the process of reading it and discovering a God who wants their freedom within it gave them hope. So don't talk about biblical interpretation as an exercise in hope. Because one of the things you can do is you can give up hope and then abandon the Bible, right? right. You can say, you know, these texts have nothing else to say to me. And so I'm going to get rid of these texts and then kind of go somewhere else. And sometimes that other place leads to nihilism. So I tried to connect Bible reading and hope into... The public sphere and matters of juris- justice. Yeah. That's huge. That that focus on a Christian theology of justice in the public square is really needed. There's been a, a severe lack of public theology of people making that bridge for people. Well, it depends on what you mean when you say lack. I would say that in the African-American church, we don't have as many New Testament scholars. Right. Precisely because in the African-American tradition, we have a propensity towards ethics because a lot of African-American academics are dealing with how can we make a case for Christianity in the public square? And so there's a sense in which many black Christians are public intellectuals sure. and public theologians because the church didn't listen. So you had to make the case there. I would say that there are in some conservative spaces. They've been not really public intellectuals, but like public warriors. I think that we kind of lack the C.S. Lewis. We have people who just want to fight about two or three political issues. And as important as those issues are, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying those issues aren't important. There has to be more to the Christian, not less, but more to the Christian public witness than saying something like, I'm pro-life. A slogan is not a public theology. A slogan is a slogan. And what the church needs to do is not just articulate kind of its beliefs, but why it believes what it believes and how those things can be helpful in the public square. 
we're in a representative democracy. In a representative democracy, you get to vote your values. Right. And you get to make the case for your values publicly. And so that's part of what I think the calling is of the church in this particular moment. Yeah. I'll just kind of dovetail on that. And you mentioned you have a quote about that being in that type of governmental system that the Christian who supports policies that do the most to assist in human flourishing are showing a deep concern for others. Yes. Voting is not a Christian requirement, but it can be a profoundly Christian act. So here's yes. my question for you. Given the imperfect track records in both major party candidates coming up in the election, is it possible for voting in the 2020 election to be a profoundly Christian act? One of the ways you can look at that question, so this is the biblical scholar, this is not me ducking it, it's kind of putting it in a framework. Yeah, yeah. Let's look at Israel in the late, kind of the late era of the monarchy. And you have the problem of Israel being sinful and God going to judge Israel and send them into exile. But God says, well, I'm going to use the Babylonians to send Israel into exile. But the problem is when the Babylonians come in, the Babylonians do more damage than God told them to do. So then God says, I'm going to punish the Babylonians for being like (laughs) extra wicked. And so you see then where on one hand, it looks like there's not a good option, right? Either you allow Israel to kind of continue in their sin and they're not judged for their covenant unfaithfulness, or you use this kind of wicked person to come in here and do this and, and fix the problem. And I'm not saying that Trump and Biden are like Israel and Babylon. That's not the analogy. The analogy is that sometimes in the world, there's kind of a series of difficult options and God, his solution isn't always to step back from it and say, I'm not going to be involved in it. The Christian can make a choice between one of those two, or the Christian Mm -hmm. could say, I'm going to vote for a third party. Mm -hmm. If you voted for a third party and you're saying like, hey, Neither one of these candidates is someone who I can, in good conscience, support. I just don't see it. I, mm-hmm. Like, as an African-American Christian, I just can't see mm-hmm. looking at the last four years and seeing that it's been good for black and brown people in this country. I don't see it. And I don't know very many people who do see it. So sure. on the other side, if you say, well, I have a strong pro-life convictions, and because of that, I am going to say, well, I have real trouble voting for a Democratic candidate, then I can say I understand that problem. And it's not my job to convince you to vote for a Democrat. That's not necessarily my thing. What I do want to say is when we want to vote for one of the lesser or two evils, what we tend to do to intellectually justify that is make one of the evils even more evil, right? So we tend to say, oh, Mm. everyone is so, so horrible here. Then that gives me some kind of moral ability to make (laughs) the other choice. And then we start saying, well, you know what? That evil isn't even actually that bad if you look at it this way. We're talking about the lesser two sure. evils. What we're actually doing is justifying one and intensifying the evil in the other. And so what I want to say is if you're going to do something, like there's going to be the lesser two evils, don't run from it, right? Don't justify it by saying, look at how horrible the Democrats are. Look at this. No, no, no. Right. Say it with your chest. I did this. And, and this is the other thing <laughs> I want to say to people. Like for me as a Christian, racism is a deal breaker. People have different deal breakers. Sure. And racism is a part of my deal break. I am both pro-life and anti-racist. If you're going mm-hmm. to kind of justify making one decision over the other, they just say it with your chest that for me, racism isn't on the list of my deal breakers. Don't reinterpret history and say, well, there is no racism here. Right. That's not being intellectually honest. Right. I like to say when it comes down to voting, and I don't really tell people how to vote, you're constantly before God. Whatever vote you make, own that vote, not necessarily in the public square of confess to Christians, but don't do any kind of intellectual hiding about it. And what I think right. is, regardless of who wins the election in 2020, the Christian is going to have some serious work to do. Right. Neither party embodies like God's kingdom. And so if one party wins, then I'm going to have a set of issues and I'm going to have to say, you know what, here are the places where I'm going to be ready for the next three to four years to contend for these things in the public square. And if the other party wins, here are the list of three or four things that I'm going to be ready to contend with. I'm never going to say, well, this party has won. Therefore, my Christian witness is done. I've kind of chosen the last of two evils. I've kind of kept America on track for like the next four years. And I can kind of retreat back to my Christian bubble. Whatever happens in November, I'm going to be saying on the next day, let's get to work. That's really good. You may have already answered this next question by your last answer, but some Christians have argued that using the construct of race or terms like racism is inherently hierarchical 
and divisive. Some people will point to like Darwin. Obviously, you already had the Virginia slave codes and things like that that had already institutionalized it. A lot of people would say that abandoning the term of race for terms like ethnicity or even racial identity would be more helpful. So my question is this, from your lens as a Christian theologian and also as a black man in America, do you believe race is the most helpful terminology for believers to use as we seek to create a just society? Well, I think the first thing that we have to do is kind of understand what's going on behind that question in the larger history of kind of racialized language in the United States. And there's two things I want to say. First is, and this is not you, obviously, this is just kind of where this discourse arises from. And people need to understand this is the initial pushback on the question. There's a long history, a long history in this country of policing black language around oppression. And by the majority of culture, choosing the kinds of language that are acceptable for the discussion. And behind that is this idea that if we just chose the right set of terms, that we could come to some conclusion about you know, the things to disagree. And so we spend a lot of time debating the terms to describe what's going on. And that kind of discussion around terminology almost always arises from the people in power, not necessarily the people who are kind of a part of the underclass. I'm not saying the underclass never asked that question, but that's where this comes from, right? But the other thing that you can look at is this is not just happening around the discussion of the language around race, but you can look at someone like Frederick Douglass, who is now seen as a hero. You look at people like Martin Luther King, who's now seen as a hero. And at the time, the criticism that was levied against them was the problem is their language. And they just changed their tone and they used the proper theological terms that people would agree. But terms are ways of depicting reality. And when people say, well, the first thing I want to do is get clear on the terms, sometimes it's the way of avoiding the reality. Now, let's do a second thing about like race and the interesting like twist in what's kind of going on now. This is an oversimplification, but just follow me along. Historically, obviously, race is a construct that has no real meaning. Let's talk about Asian. Encompasses tremendous ethnic variety, some of whom have no real relationship to one another. And the purpose of creating those categories is to create a hierarchy that would then use to justify oppressing people. In American culture, things like white was defined by law. It wasn't just this inherent biological thing. It's like, okay, you're right. legally white, and therefore you get these privileges. You're legally black, therefore you don't get these privileges. Right. As it relates to white-black relationships, white is kind of the purity from which things deviate. So we have one drop right. of black blood in you because you're no longer purely white, right. you're now black. The one drop rule. Right, that's kind of a construct. But who created the construct and who benefited from it? The majority culture did. So what happened was, the ethnic minorities started saying, you know what? These groups are sometimes helpful as collectives to push back on systems of oppression, right? And so because there's a common experience of being black in America, even if I'm from the African diaspora or I'm a descendant of slaves, that there's something common that we experience because of our black skin in this country. And in that sense, Black is a helpful kind of term. Asian Americans have made the same kind of, in general, these same kinds of ideas. They've done studies that most Latinos or Latinos in America don't go by the broad category. They will say, I'm Cuban, I'm Mexican, I am whatever. But they will also say, when we're talking about group dynamics, we will embrace that identity. So ethnic minorities kind of slide in and out of these things as it benefits them. Now, Who's the person who says, let's stop using these categories now? The people who are mostly saying, let's stop using these categories are the people for whom this collective action is now being pushed against. It's now the majority culture that created these things to oppress people. The oppressed people then use to their advantage are now saying, well, you can't use the terms. And now let's kind of get rid of race as the majority culture's prescription for solving the racial problem. Right. What I want to say is, Maybe the ethnic minorities themselves should have agency to determine how they want to be described. And so I don't say, like, you have to use black or racial categories. And I don't think that racism exists because of racial categories. That's not how racism works. Right. But things that aren't true, that aren't biologically true, can still have real world effects. And so using racial categories, here's another example. It is simply a fact that Asian people are experiencing discrimination because of their perceived Asian-ness in America. And getting a bunch of academics, high-minded people to stop using the term Asian-American isn't gonna stop someone from 
yelling at someone on the street because of COVID-19. Sure. So if we say that person's Chinese and not Asian, then the person isn't going to be racist towards them. That's not how the language works. That's not how society works. And so I don't think language games is what I call it. It's kind of a linguistic soup that allows for the attached analysis. Instead of asking the question is, well, what if instead of stop saying the word Asian or African-American, we have a discussion about privilege sure, or structural sin? I'm not going to die on the hill to say, to say like, we have to keep the term Asian American or Asian. But I would say, like, I don't think that's the main issue we need to be addressing. And it's really, really weird. It's really, really weird to find yourself, if I'm in the majority culture, wrong both times around the use of a category. And I want to say that the majority culture probably, especially in kind of conservative Christian circles, find themselves once again telling ethnic minorities how they must describe themselves. I understand what you're saying, especially coming from a majority culture. I'm more thinking of people like one of the ladies from Truth's Table went to a conference in Texas somewhere. It was a white evangelical conference, and she was advocating for basically use of ethnic identities over race and other people. That's more the lens that I'm coming from with that question. Sorry, maybe I was not as clear. So I think that that's Mm -hmm. fine Mm -hmm. as far as a decision that one makes. And I do think ethnic identity over kind of racial categories, one is biblical and one isn't. What I'm saying is that if people want to say Latinos, which is a perfect example, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. come from a variety of places, but there's a common set of biases that they experience, and they decide to gather together to push back on those biases, then I have no problem with that. Right, right. Because the agencies with the, that community, agencies with them. If someone says, well, I'm Cuban. I'm not going to say, well, you're a Latino. <laughs> the tricky part about this in America, and forgive me, this is a biblical scholar talking about this. Yeah, so yeah. Forgive me if I'm sliding into sociology. No, you could. African-Americans, American descendants of slaves, don't have a ethnicity in a traditional sense. Right. I don't know where I'm from. So I'm black. Now, of course, I can go back and I can do, and if I wasn't like paranoid, not wanting to give people my <laughs> DNA, I could go and find out where I'm from. But like that, is not my reality. That's not the reality right. of most black people in America. Right. So while most people, like, and I think Akimini could say, I'm Nigerian. I think she's Nigerian. She said, I'm Nigerian. And she made me able to talk about her tribe because her family immigrated here. Mm-hmm. I can't do that. Right. And so by saying all I have in one sense is African-American, almost as like a, a tribe mm-hmm. that's mm-hmm. developed in the United States because we were cut off from our history. But right. the problem about that category is that there are other people consistently added to it. Yeah. So in the community, for example, are both African-American that we mean different things by that. And so in a black context, I'm much more comfortable with black as a generic term Mm -hmm. because we can't kind of revert back to our ethnic identities in the easy way. And this is much different. And this is the reason why I used Asian American and Latino American. So you think about like India and the Philippines or something, Philippines, like what they have in common is radically different trying to think of them as one group than to say, wait, okay, I'm from somewhere in Africa and now someone has kind of come here and been raised, even though they weren't a descendant of slaves, they then receive all of those stereotypes immediately. So there's a different kind of commonality and I can't easily trace my family back. I can't go back and visit my right. auntie in Uganda or wherever. Yeah. And so I do think there's a distinction as it relates to African-American and black and other ethnic groups, which actually informs how you come to this question. I'm working on this book called The New Testament in Color. A lot of evangelical books do a lot with global theology, but they don't do a lot with North American ethnic groups. Mm -hmm. And so I said, you know what? I want to write a book that doesn't do global stuff, that it does like American ethnic minorities. Mm -hmm. And so I'm trying to research it and I'm thinking, okay, then where are the seven historic Asian American churches, like the seven historic black churches? Mm. And I started understanding that like the Asian American Christian tradition is much different than the African American Christian tradition because the African American Christian tradition kind of backstops at slavery. Mm -hmm. So it's much easier to have a North American focus for our story. Even like the West Coast, where there's a large immigrant experience of Asian Americans. And I realized like there's a much more complex ongoing relationship between 
ethnic minorities who are Asian and then maybe even their home countries right. and continued family connections. You're correct that depending on the perspective, Asian American has a different kind of diversity within it. I try not to like police that for that reason, but I can see why someone like Kimini would say, no, 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 let's claim my ethnic identity, let's deconstruct race. But I want to say that in some cases, especially like African descendants of slaves, right. it's not as easy as it is in other countries. If you take away the racial identity, it's almost like you're taking away all the cultural identity. Like me, I'm a descendant of a slave. I don't have a traditional ethnicity in the sense of Rwanda, Uganda, Nigeria, Kenya. I just don't have it. Right. And me getting the DNA test won't give that to me. Yeah. I am much more adamant about fighting for the term black than I am about fighting for the term Asian or Latino. Sure. No, thank you for sharing all that. Maybe shifting gears a little bit to your theological hat and also touching on you being an Anglican priest. So we had a yes. discussion in our Facebook group, our Praise Hands Facebook group. The discussion was when we see the church as having a calling to care for the poor, how okay should we be if that is coming through the government? Should we be totally cool with that? Should we say, you know, hey, our first thing is for the church to take care of it, but then if the church doesn't do it, we should welcome the government's help? Or some people would say like, no, we don't want the government's help at all. And where I'm going with this is from your background as an Anglican priest, obviously there's a difference yeah. between the Church of England officially and the Anglican Church, and maybe you can break that down for us. But given the way that the foundation was laid before the United States came into being with the vestry system, if you're familiar with that in colonial Virginia. And looking at this history, what can we learn from Anglican history and theology when it comes to the intersection of church and state? Well, I want to leave the Anglican part to the side and try to answer the other question from like a biblical sure. perspective. I think that's helpful if I understand you correctly. Now, there's two ways to start thinking about this question. We'll look at Israel and then we'll look at the people surrounding Israel as a kind of picture of this. Obviously, you can say that Israel is unique in the sense that it's kind of God, it's a theocracy. But in mm -hmm. Israel, you have these laws put in place where there's kind of the don't glean to the edges. There are all these societal protections for the poor, defend the mm -hmm. orphan and defend the widow. When you start reading these things in Deuteronomy in these places where they talk about compassion towards the foreigner and support of those in need, it said, you remember what you experienced in Egypt, therefore you should be compassionate. So the important part of that is that the experiences of Israel were supposed to create kind of a disposition towards the poor and the marginalized. Now, how do you then apply that idea to a democratic republic that is not a theocracy? Well, here's the thing. We are in a democratic republic in which we vote our values. Mm -hmm. Right. And so if a Christian has values that say we should care for those who are marginalized, and there's nothing unbiblical about saying, well, what kind of government policies can we put in place that help those who are in need? Because a secular person who says, I don't believe there is a transcendent God, and I want to make as much money as possible, I'm going to vote to put in place laws that allow me to accumulate as much money as possible. Mm -hmm. In a republic, we have to convince people these are good things for society to do. Not to implement the law, not to say like you go straight from Israel to America or Canada or somewhere. They're just saying like we can talk about ways in which the government can do its job. There's a second way to look at the same thing, the same set of text. You look at something like Nebuchadnezzar. Talk about these texts hiding in plain sight. So you know the story Nebuchadnezzar goes crazy. He's going to have to eat straw in the fields. And so there's the prophecy that Daniel gives to Nebuchadnezzar. And he says, you know what? You are super arrogant. So God says, I'm going to make you crazy for a little bit. But then if you read the very end of that, I think it's in Daniel chapter four, go back and read it to the listeners. He says, Daniel warns him, he says, stop being arrogant and stop oppressing the poor. Stop doing injustice. So there's two reasons why Nebuchadnezzar was judged. One, the Nebuchadnezzar was arrogant and the other one because Nebuchadnezzar was exploiting people. What is Nebuchadnezzar in the ancient Near East? He's a pagan. He's a non-believer. Mm -hmm. But God says, I'm still going to judge you because as king, you could care for those who are in need. And then you could do something like go to the prophets, go to all the places where in Isaiah and these other places where he said, I'm going to judge the Edomites and I'm going to judge all of these different nations of the world. And oftentimes the nations of the world are being judged for injustice. Mm -hmm. So why would God judge a pagan country for being unjust? as the leaders, because maybe God thinks that even non-believing societies can put in place some practices that care for the marginalized. Let's put these two things together. 
in the Bible, there are pagan governments in the form of a king. Doesn't change if it now becomes a democracy. Pagan governments mm -hmm. are judged for injustice. And the Bible says, hey, Christian, you should care about poor people. Now I'm in a democratic republic that is secular. Then I'm allowed to say, hey, let's look at the ways in which we can do things to help people. Now, what does that mean for the church? That doesn't mean that the church doesn't do its job, right? The church still is the church. And the church shouldn't expect the government to solve all of the problems. And all we have to do is vote for these policies. And then we're there. Mm -hmm. Part of the reality of the church is that like our care is ultimately often personal mm -hmm. and direct, right? So the church can do things like feed people. We can do things like jobs. We can't run whole school systems. So the sense in which the church can do its job, A, is being witness to the wider society about these broad principles and then doing the direct ministry person to person because governments can be by nature kind of these impersonal entities. And so I think it's fine sure. for a Christian to, on the one hand, say, what are the ways in which we can put policies in place to give humans the best chance of flourishing while at the same time doing the face-to-face, person-to-person kind of work? Because when a church does it, when the church does it, when the church goes and helps someone apply for a job or the church goes and does tutoring, it's in the wider context of saying, let me show you what these things mean. And so I think that you can never lose the church's own activism, its own public ministry as a testimony to the coming kingdom. The government, this is what I want to say about what I want a government to be able to do as a Christian. This may seem strange, <laughs> but to like keep society in place and well-functioning and keep people with the chance to flourish so they might hear the gospel. One of the things that happens when economic communities get depressed is that they stop taking care of that particular community. So the grass stops getting cut, the place stops getting painted. And so when you go into an impoverished community, the spiritual despair can often be seen in the physicality of the space. Like you've been in that place like, oh man, it feels bad. And, and sometimes part of the evangelistic work is before you can easily bring the gospel there, you sometimes have to change the physical space. Hmm. And then people can kind of hear the gospel. It's hard to do like street evangelism when it's raining all of the time. <laughs> part of the government's job is not to do the work of evangelism for the church, but to help to create a space within which the gospel can be heard such that, you know, people can take care of themselves and do these other kinds of things. And so that's kind of one of the ways that I see the government being able to function. As someone who's in a democratic republic, to help create a structure within which the church can live and move and do its work. Yeah, that's really good. From your perspective, when we look at these different injustices that are in societies, whether it's economic, whether it's racial, what solutions do you see Christianity offering to these injustices? Oh man, there's a <laughs> chapter in my book called Cross Breaks the Wheel. There's a false way of looking at this and saying, let's just preach the gospel and then people will like stop being racist. <laughs> History has proven that that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Not in the sense of the gospel doesn't work, but it's called discipleship. You have to tell new believers stuff, the stuff they didn't know. You can say, Jesus died for your sins. Sure. The next week it's like, okay, you need to stop sleeping with your girlfriend. Like, well, hold on. <laughs> like, what do you mean? Why do I got to stop sleeping with my girlfriend? And that to say, okay, here's how the story of Christianity touches upon your mm -hmm. sexual ethics. People don't always intuit that. You have mm -hmm. to tell them. That's why Paul says, stop sleeping with your mother-in-law. He doesn't just say, believe the gospel. Mm -hmm. you, right. and you immediately stop sleeping with your mother-in-law. He says, no, no, no. This isn't how we act. The gospel does have the power to change people. But as part of the job of the pastor is to say, this is how it changes people. And so this is when I'm going to talk about injustice. All of us have both wronged others and been wronged by others. Like we all have beef. Mm -hmm. Everybody's done something to somebody. There is no completely innocent person other than Jesus. And if we just start taking revenge upon one another, we're going to burn the thing to the mm -hmm. ground. This is what happens in the Old Testament. God sends the Babylonians in to judge Israel. The Babylonians are so sinful. God says, I'm going to judge the Babylonians for sending Israel with this other nation. This other nation kind of goes mm -hmm. bad. And mm -hmm. now the Israelites and the, and the Babylonians are mad at these people. And so it's just, it's in the cycle of revenge. But what is there in society that gives me both the resources to talk about the reality of evil and the possibility of forgiveness? And I think that's the cross. The cross allows us to say that God takes sin utterly seriously, mm -hmm. such that he dies to reconcile us to God. But it also gives me the spiritual resources to forgive. Because it's only in the context of saying I've been profoundly forgiven by God that I find the emotional resources to forgive my enemy. I don't think there's a philosophy that does that. Right. I don't. 
And so what does the church offer to the world? A cruciform gospel that carries with it the possibility of forgiveness it's not a forgiveness that kind of wipes away the past. It's not a forgiveness that like says that there is no justice, right? The gospel didn't say that none of these sins ever happened. Right. The gospel says there's something on the other side of those sins. And so that means I can say to America or my white brothers and sisters, this is exactly what happened. I don't have to lie mm-hmm. about it. When I confess my sins to Jesus, I don't got to lie about it. I did A, B, and C, mm-hmm. and God forgave me. And so when I talk about what happened in America, I can say they did this, this, and this. But there's something on the other side of it. Apart from the cross, what we tend to do is to say, well, the only way there's hope for reconciliation if it wasn't so bad. So we say, you know what? Maybe slavery wasn't so bad. Maybe Jim Crow wasn't so bad. So there's less of a way to go. So no, 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 no. It was just as bad as we think that it was. But in God, there's hope for something else. And so this may seem like an overly simplistic, but I think that the nature of the Christian message itself carries within it the power for truth telling about sin justice, and something that comes after. The other version is, I must extract from you what I think is due to me because of what happened. And the history of humanity is that we're very bad at extracting what was done to us. I see it all the time with my kids. (laughs) If one kid says something to the kid, hurts them, they try to hurt them twice as much. (laughs) And so that's why there's a portion of the book called The Cross Breaks the Wheel. The message of Jesus then also informs how we do our advocacy. Hmm. So Jesus brings the world to himself by an act of sacrificial, nonviolent love. Mm -hmm. And the means by which you get something is the means by which you keep something. So not only do I have like this means of forgiveness from the cross, right, this end, but it also talks about the means. And so now as a Christian, my witness before the watching world is rooted in love even though the world is broken. I don't have to lie about what the world is, but I can love it anyway. So I just don't think that there is, and I don't think Christianity is a philosophy, but I don't think there's another like way of approaching the world that has both the seriousness of our brokenness and the profound hope. And it's in a person, right? Right. It's in a person. It's not a philosophy. And I just can't imagine a Christianity that pulls back from this. I think it's part of our witness before the watching world. That's really good. I want to zoom into something you said a little bit, specifically on this theme of hope. And obviously that's one of the things N.T. Wright is known for. So amidst this global social disruption, systemic racism and political and economic system that is never quite good enough, what reasons do we have for hope in this year called 2020? I always say you have to ask theological questions in the right order. And a lot of times heresies come when you ask the questions in the wrong order. Hmm. When you say the question, or looking at 2020, how can I find hope? And you're looking at 2020, there may not be a lot of source of hope. But 2020 has the number, the year 2020, even though the number is not exactly right, but it's 2020 years since the resurrection of our Lord. And so the question you have to ask yourselves when the world seems to be tilting or shaking is the tomb empty or not? And if the tomb was empty, then what's happening in 2020 can't unresurrect Jesus. So the tomb was empty or the tomb was not empty. Paul says this, right? Christ is not risen of all men. He says this in the first century. With all men, most to be pitied. And so when I look at 2020, I say, this is bad. But I go back and I read the Gospels. And I say, I think that I trust the witness of the apostles and the women that the tomb was empty on the third day. And because of that, the world is a different place, even though I don't experience it as such. One of the things that happens when you live in America, because it's a, it's a good country, in a lot of ways, we can get this perception that God has promised us this comfortable or this good life, but he hasn't. Mm-hmm. And so I'm glad that the Bible doesn't promise me health, wealth, and happiness. Because then I could say, like, man, this is a raw <laughs> deal. But the Bible that I read had Jesus saying, in this world, you have many troubles. But be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. This is the incarnation. Listen, the light shines in the darkness. The darkness. The world is dark. Paul says, mm-hmm. we've been transformed from the kingdom of darkness into the like, kingdom of the beloved son. So that means the, the kingdom of darkness, though, still exists. Mm-hmm. The light is shining surrounded by darkness. I wrote an article about this. The fourth day of Christmas, Mm -hmm. 
in the Anglican tradition, the Feast of the Holy Innocents, where they slaughter all of the babies trying to kill Jesus. I used to ask myself, well, why do you celebrate Christmas on one day, the 25th, and then like four days later, you're remembering the slaughter of these babies? Like, why doesn't the incarnation, Mm -hmm. why doesn't Jesus stop Mm -hmm. the babies from getting killed? And then I thought to myself, and this is kind of the point of that article, there is no other world into which the incarnation comes than the world in which babies are slaughtered by people in power to maintain that power. This is the world within which we live. Like, read the story. They killed Jesus. They killed him. So then what do we expect to happen in 2020? Why wouldn't there be racial unrest? Why wouldn't there be? Why wouldn't there be disease? Listen, we're not platonic, where we feel like, you know, when I die, my soul is going to zoom up to be with Jesus. The Christian believes that all of us have a fatal case of this thing called death, where our body is going to go into the ground and start to disintegrate. But God in his power is going to call that dead body back to life. So then, of course, then we're going to live in a world where death still stalks us. Just because we now in America have to apply the full weight of the gospel to our present circumstances, it doesn't mean we're without hope. I mean, what do we think the resurrection is for? Then not the defeat of death and disease and pandemics. In the Anglican tradition, it's so weird. We have this thing called the Great Litany that we do every year during Lent. We would read it. I've read it 15 times. But it was written, you know, hundreds of years ago. And it's like from plague, pestilence, Mm -hmm. and famine, good Lord deliver us. We say this. But like we were saying from plague as an antiquarian idea. Mm -hmm. But like now from plague deliver us, it's like, oh, it's real. real." Why do you think the Christians in the 1800s wrote a prayer that says deliver us from plagues? There's a sense in which we can normalize American prosperity. Think of the death rate And I'm not making light of COVID-19. Think of the death rate of AIDS in parts of sub-Saharan Africa in the 80s and the 90s. Right. And compare that to what we're thinking we're experiencing in 2020. 170,000 people dead is a tragedy. But I would love to go and say, like, how many people died of AIDS in a year or in six months during the height of the epidemic in some parts of the majority world? So this is not like saying that the losses that we have in America aren't serious. It's saying that like the Bible takes the brokenness of human society, including our own physical bodies, very seriously. And there's one who's defeated death. And that person is Jesus. And if that is true, 2020 can kick rocks because there's nothing they can do in light of the coming kingdom. And that's what gives me hope. That's really good. Well, Esau, thank you for speaking to all this. You put a lot of study, obviously, into a lot of these topics, and I appreciate you going there with us. How can listeners learn more about you and also buy your new book? You can buy the book by going to any kind of place where you normally buy it. You can go to your local bookstores. You can go to Amazon. You can go to IVP. Reading While Black, African-American. Here's mm-hmm. I tell people this all of the time. If you're going to be a writer and you write a book and you get really excited about the title, recognize that you have to say that title over and over again. <laughs> so say the title out loud and ask yourself, can I say this well? I always mess up my own book. Title. <laughs> Reading While Black, African-American Biblical Interpretation as an Exercise in Hope. It's designed for, and there's discussion questions at the end. It's designed for people to be able to read and engage it in groups. So get a group of people together, read it. Hopefully it's, it's hopeful for you. The purpose of it is not to say that I'm right about everything, but to encourage people to attend closely to the biblical text and kind of understand what they mean. You can also find me on social media. I'm the only Esau Macaulay on social media. So if you search for that guy, you'll eventually find me. I always tell people to pray for me because it's not easy to write and do these things and exist in public. So pray for me that I continue to be a faithful steward of all of the things that God has given me to do in this season. I may not respond to every message that I get because I get a lot of them. I love you anyway. (laughs) Well, listeners, as you hear this, pray for Esau. He's got a a lot in front of him. This book is going to be getting in front of a lot of people. And I'll just pray right now, Esau, that that God blesses you and and helps you be able to steward the ministry that he's given you to do and that he blesses your family and helps you to navigate through the season just with him and emerge through it stronger, emerge through it uh, even more refreshed, as crazy as that might seem. And, uh, and more affirmed in what the Lord's put you here to do. So thank you for what you're doing and many blessings. Thank you. And thanks for listening, all of the listeners. Shout out to the listener. <laughs> <laughs> I'll talk to you later. All it's right. good to catch up with you. All right. Thanks, Esau.
Man, so many quotes from this episode. I'm gonna, I'm gonna read a couple of my favorites. He said, a slogan is not a public theology. A slogan is a slogan. He also said, the church needs to articulate why it believes what it believes and how those things can be helpful in the public square. I love that as well. It's, uh, it's sometimes easy for us in the church to assume that people have the same belief system that we do. And when we say a certain statement that they understand the values that are behind that, but that's not always the case. Uh, He also said, the cross allows us to talk about both the reality of evil and the possibility of forgiveness. So good. Um, Let's see, what's happened in 2020 can't unresurrect Jesus. Really powerful stuff. Uh, So glad you guys could tune in today. If you want to join the conversation about this episode, we'd love to have you in the Facebook group. You can go to praisehands.com slash get involved. Join a private curated conversation about this episode and many others. We would love to have you. And of course, if you want to volunteer, praisehands.com slash volunteer is the place to go for that. As always, we so appreciate your support, whether that's through a monthly donation, which you can do at praisehands.com slash donate, through a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts, or just sharing this episode with your friends. As we examine the American intersection of church, race, music, and economics, we love knowing there are listeners just like you on the journey with us. We'll see you right back here in two weeks.